Welcome to Meditation and Aliens with Doro and Matt, a webcast that explores everything we currently know about the truth about aliens, human history, reality, consciousness, and the role meditation can do to help us understand all these things, and how we might all work together to build the best world possible for all beings, human or non-human alike. Meditation and Aliens is hosted by me, Matt Reddy. I'm an amateur ufologist. I have a degree in philosophy. I'm the creator of HiveOne.net. I'm also an elected public hospital commissioner in Jefferson County, Washington. Each week, I am joined by Doro Kiley, longtime meditator, meditation teacher, and an experiencer with many stories, and life coach extraordinaire. You can find more about Doro at her website, creationcoach.com. Now, on to the show. And we're back with another episode of Meditation and Aliens. How you doing, Doro? I'm doing great. How you been, Matt? I'm really good. Really good. I think and this is going to be another good one, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think we got some interesting stuff to talk about. To say the least. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, first I went down a new rabbit hole, and uh, now you've gone down the rabbit hole. So, uh, <laughs> It's so definitely a rabbit hole. I mean, that's the biggest rabbit hole I've been down. So, yeah, we got to talk about this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we'll we will come back to that. Um, let's see. Well, how has your week been besides, you know, uh, research on alien well, theory? Well, besides that, besides all the, the video stuff I've been watching, I'm also watching this channel called Stefan Burns. Let's see, S T E F O N burns like burning, burning brush. Um, and he follows the solar flares and the Schumann resonances, uh, the frequencies of the earth. And he says, uh, for the past 10 days, we have been getting bombarded by um, energy from the sun, which is picking up the resonance of the earth. And we are just like little antennas. That's the way he describes, you know, um, us because we are walking around vertically like antennas, you know, pulling energy from the earth and pulling energy down from the sun. So we're, if anybody else is feeling a little bit electrocuted lately, I think that's what we're feeling. So <laughs> Yeah. Well, yesterday, um, I think it was yesterday, there was a massive outage of cell phone service. And I think that uh, was the solar, uh, the solar energy coming in. I mean, it's big. We've had two X class flares in the last 10 days. So, and, it, and yeah. we're still getting pummeled. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of people talking on Twitter and X about it. And, uh, this, I don't believe the mainstream is uh, saying they know the cause. They're not giving credit to the solar flares. No, um, they like to keep everybody scared. Oh, my God, yeah. it's an attack. Yeah, no, it's, the, it's I'm sure it's the flares. In fact, this guy, Stefan Burns, he's brilliant. Um, he, he would he would blame the flares <laughs> on the outage. Well, there's um, there's a, a show called PBS Space Time that delves into physics and uh all sorts of different you know realms of of physics and science hmm. and uh there's an episode that they released that he explained in theory it would be it should be possible for an advanced civilization to direct a energy um an energy beam towards our sun to either to turn this to make the sun produce solar flares or to make it um you could even turn our sun into a engine you could make it like direct out uh you know gas and stuff like say down uh in a direction to actually make it move our whole solar system like I've a spaceship i have heard that i mean that is yeah. too too outrageous <laughs> yeah i mean it's yeah but it's like uh, there, I've, it basically it connects to the theory that it's possible the solar flares are being done on purpose by it, you know, yeah. as a, a weapon. To, they, a lot of people on Twitter are saying maybe it's a test to see if it works to knock out our communication systems. That is interesting because um, this guy, Stefan Burns, he says this is extremely anomalous. 
and you know in in his years of of study and teaching this stuff he's some of this stuff he's never seen before so yeah it could be who knows it could be you know could manipulated be. yep um so that's happening i got another piece of information um okay <laughs> Well, this is just that the, you know, the NDAA and the UAP Disclosure Act that got gutted uh, last year, but did pass in partial form through Congress, mm -hmm. it it did have some stuff in it. And one of the things it had was that the, the National Archives has to create a special department and filing system to collect all information about UAPs, UFOs, all the way back to 1945. And it actually um it's it it actually got created and it has some files have been put into it and so the internet has been uh been seeing on twitter people are like digging through there has been a document dump and there's a bunch of stuff in there that they're saying it's got some good stuff like some photos of you know flying saucers and stuff that are really clear um, is this is this related to the Stephen Greer uh, thing? What he's doing because I know he's trying to compile all this information too together. I, I mean, no, this is uh, this is just a, an official uh, collection place in the government for stuff. And I'm sure you know if he's been collecting as much data and info as he has, he's claimed that he has been sharing it with the government. So I'm sure there's overlap. Okay. Um, but no, this is just the official government mm -hmm. uh, UAP information collection in the national archives and uh one of the things that jumped out to me and i'm trying to verify it is some of these documents are referencing mj12 and majestic 12 which is wow. a really another deep rabbit hole theory mm -hmm. that that was one of the names given to the uh the organization that was first in charge of the secrecy around ufos starting back in the uh, 40s 50s truman um you know, and uh, connected to uh, the early first Secretary of Defense, Forrest Stahl, who died in extremely mis mysterious ways, falling out a window. Huh. Um, and uh, Bill Cooper, who talked a ton about, he was an early ufologist talking a ton about Majestic 12, and Bill Cooper died in mysterious ways, shot by IRS agents. Oh, wow. Um yeah, so it's a uh, so some information seems to be coming out in there. So that that could be there. There could be just a steady stream of in documents being dumped into that, and so it could be a really interesting resource to to see yeah. what details. Yeah, it is interesting. In. I I think well, last time I watched, uh, well, Stephen Greer was putting out a call for help to get somebody to take all of this information that he has compiled and put it in order and maybe what he's doing is is uh helping to upload it onto this website this government website yeah because he wants the public to have access to it and it would make sense that 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 would be the place to put it yeah it's possible mm -hmm. yeah interesting let's see all right so before we start talking about farsight uh the other three i just wanted to mention that I've over the last year, a couple times, I've started petitions on change.org that could really help with the humanity uh, organizing around what to do about aliens. And wow. <laughs> I just wanted to mention them. One is um, a petition for elected leaders to declare that they are independent from alien control. So it's, you know, I signed it because I'm an elected local politician. But I'll it's like, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like, a, I mean, I think that's a good, simple first step because it, it seems if, if aliens are secretly controlling our earth, then they're, they're doing it by having people in positions actually uh, be, have allegiance to them. And, yeah. and it seems that there's, there seems some consistency in the universe that uh, oaths are actually significant. Like they actually do rely on people swearing oaths and, you know, that's why they make such a big deal at the, um, you know, about the, uh, the pledge of allegiance and the, uh, standing for the national anthem and, uh, you know, honoring the flag is they, <clears throat> they really do. These are methods of control. And so I think it actually 
would be difficult for someone that has pledged allegiance to a secret organization of some sort to to clearly pledge publicly that they are not under control of any aliens. Um, anyways, it's worth it's, it's worth a to, shot. It's, yeah, it's hard to believe anybody these days. I you know there's a lot of deception and. <laughs> you know, not telling the truth, um, whether it's by lying or omission. How do you trust? Uh, yeah, how do you trust? that's a big one. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the other two petitions, one is a simple vote of no confidence in all Earth governments and leaders and requesting we start over and create a new system. <laughs> I'll, I'll sign that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put yeah. links to these in our show description. Okay. And then the uh, the new one I just did was just a clear petition that says we hereby nullify all secret agreements between human governments and non-human entities. And we insist that if we're going to have agreements that we openly and transparently negotiate them, sort of inspired by the Farsight uh, work. Right. Um, okay. But that's something I've been thinking about for a while. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that's, that kind of brings us to the Farsight.org topic. Farsight, the Farsight Institute being a, Institute of remote viewers trying to use remote viewing in a scientific method to figure out what the heck's going on with aliens and human history. And they, um, they have, uh, tons of, tons of information on YouTube and it's, um, and, uh, yeah. And, and I think, um, and they have a, uh, a big video on YouTube, like a two hour video where they claim to, telepathically be talking to two different alien groups of friendly ETs, they call them, asking them to help intervene because they believe Earth is a, basically a prison planet controlled by reptilian aliens. <laughs> so this is the two hour video I watched, I think, right? The yeah. public negotiations with extraterrestrials on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, what do you what do you think of that? So you watched a you watched that whole thing? I watched probably um, three quarters of it. It was long and I kind of had got distracted. But uh, yeah, it, you know, for me, I'm really ha having to practice stretching my my brain because it, especially nowadays, it's so hard to tell what's real, what's not real. And, you know, it's hard when we don't experience it ourselves, which of course means I'm just going to have to learn how to do this remote viewing myself. <laughs> mm -hmm. To really really wrap my head around it if it's um if it's real you know uh so i got a lot out of it and i and i do think that this guy has a good idea you know you, you can't trust the top military to try to do negotiations with aliens uh you know and uh, and have them represent all of humanity i mean that doesn't work like that um what was the example he gave something like uh you, you know when the europeans were making contracts with um with the americans here for slaves i don't know how what it, what the details were but they were making agreements he called them agreements that that the slaves would be brought to them and you can't do that saying that the slaves are in agreement <laughs> to be kidnapped and and broad and used for slaves, but they kept calling it an agreement. Um, so the same thing with dealing with aliens, you can't have top military saying, you know, all of humanity is willing to do this labor or whatever, you know, give their DNA or they'll, they agree to be abducted and manipulated, you know. So yeah, we've got to get them out of the way, this top military that wants to control and somehow make our own voices heard. We do yeah, not well, want to be manipulated, right? Yeah, well, that's why I made the petition that says, look, all these agreements are, we are declaring them null and void if you have agreements with aliens. And it's, right. and that's a, Courtney Brown made a great metaphor there saying, yeah, the the contracts between the slave traders and the American colonies over the slaves, they, those agreements are not relevant to the slaves. Right. Yeah, the, the slaves are not those that's aren't right. valid from the point of view of the slaves <laughs> that's right so uh, i'm all for that i totally was on board with with his whole talk about that yeah yeah well i guess so i asked um 
I took the transcript from that whole negotiation and plugged it into chat GPT and asked it to just summarize like the narrative framework that the, uh, that Farsight Institute has for how, how it all fits together. Oh, wow. um, okay. And so just to clarify for the audience, uh, first of all, I asked it, explain the different alien groups that the Farsight is talking about. And basically the Farsight said there's one, there's reptilians. They say reptilians are one of the primary antagonist, antagonistic extra, uh, extraterrestrial forces involved with Earth. They're described to have a significant secret influence over human affairs and are implicated in maintaining Earth as a prison planet. It, and they suggest that the reptilians are manipulative, control-oriented, seek to exploit humanity and Earth's resources for their own gain. They are mentioned as having established bases on Earth, um, the Moon, and Mars, and uh, also digging deeper into Farsight stuff. They say the reptilians don't come from this galaxy. They say they came from another galaxy through a uh, sort of like a wormhole and that they are seem to be actually controlled by an incredibly powerful AI. Like they're ultimately, they're either controlled by an AI or an AI is used as a remote sort of commander for them. Like, so maybe it's, they might have a, they might have a living, maybe it might be a living reptilian king or something in their home galaxy, but they, they've done these remote viewing and they often see an AI sort of uh, really closely either controlling or working with their head, head reptilian honcho, like on the moon. That um, so much reminds me of the Borg in yeah. Star Trek, right? Mm -hmm. Same concept, just this hive mind, everybody connected, you know, through technologies. And yeah, I, I think we're pretty close here ourselves. So, uh, what else did you find? Um, well, just to, uh, we'll come back to the reptilians, but because there are a, a lot to say about them, but they also they say there's these Orions. Uh, who are very human looking, Nordic, often Nordic blonde or redheaded. Um, and they are, uh, have a sort of an alliance with the reptilians, but they're not super good friends. Like I think one story, they actually did a remote viewing of the, the aliens negotiating with, uh, I think Eisenhower. And they said the, the reptilians and the Orions would not be in the same room together. They had to be in separate rooms, but they were, still negotiating with the humans together so that was kind of weird yeah um so let's see um yeah so they're also playing a role here on earth they're part of the control complex do you think um, that the orions do you think that that that's what influenced the nazis for you know yeah that they wanted to have the aryan race no i think there's definitely a connection there oh you do okay yeah, yeah. Man, and they awesome. and they did a they did a remote viewing of the um, of uh, Antarctica and uh, what was it called? The Operation High Jump down there, and it seemed the the Nazis and the reptilians and maybe the Orions were involved in that a, a big sort of conflict down there. And it sounds like the reptilians and them basically have a, they are in control of Antarctica. That is that is like one of their home bases. You know what I just realized that Orion and Arian are very close in terminology. Mm. Yeah, I didn't even I hadn't even thought of that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, um, yeah, yeah, you talked about Antarctica. That was a little later in in the talk, wasn't it? So Yeah, I'm jumping to cuz I've watched a ton of their other videos, so I'm kind of okay. like pulling in some stuff I know from uh their other their other videos as well. But then um, let's see. And then there's also the, the, but the people in this video you watched where they were trying to negotiate, they were trying to negotiate with two groups, one called the Galactic Federation of Worlds, which yeah. is, yeah, they call the sort of the good ETs there. And they are interested in assisting humanity, um, but they are constrained because technically I think the reptilians and the Orions claim they have legal rights over earth one because they have these legal agreements they claim with you know the leaders of earth um and so there's you know so it would be seen as an act of war from the galactic federation to just like tr just reveal itself 
to earth and try to intervene. And the apparently, you know, and what Courtney says is that the, the reptilians and Orions have a fairly equal level of military power to the Galactic Federation of Worlds. So they're not interested in uh, just an outright fight. You know what I think is going on? I think that they are influencing people to try, first of all, try to see if if we are capable or willing or ready to, to declare our sovereignty. You know, it's almost like the thing that comes to my mind is like, you know, a bird's eye view of a cattle feedlot, right? And the cattle, some of them are like, you know, help us, help us, and, and we're, we're getting some attention from somebody. But the majority of the cattle are just oblivious to everything. And they're trying to figure out, that I think the ones that are listening, trying to figure out if, if it's worth, if they should, you know, are we worth it? Are we capable? Would we even be able to, to be independent? Um, that's kind of what it looks like to me. So, you know, if we keep wanting our independence and proving to them that we are wise enough, intelligent enough, capable enough to recreate a, a structure that would uh, benefit all of humanity rather than being enslaved. You know, it's kind of like you open the feedlot gates and let all the cattle out. Are they going to survive? You know, we yeah. don't know. That's kind of what it looks like to me. Are yeah. we worth it? Can we do it? And uh, if, if we can't, they're not going to interfere. Well, it's interesting. I was I was watching a different R site video with Courtney today, um, and at the end of it, he was saying that he was talking about frequencies, and he was saying that uh, you know beings resonate on certain frequencies, and the reptilians resonate on the you know the base frequencies of fear and anger, and as long as humanity sort of primarily resonates on those frequencies, it's just easier. For the reptilians to control us and to manipulate everything going on and he's he's saying that these the good ets don't resonate on those frequencies and so it's like it's kind of like what you're saying they they can't really work with humanity as long as we are so you know uh, you know and so wrapped up in fear and weakness and right, um anger and, yeah yeah and he said, if we actually need to, you know, he was saying we need to meditate more. People need to meditate to raise your frequency. And if enough people on earth raise their frequency and so that these good ETs see that there is a, a strong enough community on earth that has, um, that is freed from these lower uh, vibrational things, it'll, it, he says, it'll just sort of naturally take us out of control of the reptilians um, and make Isn't it. Isn't that simple? I mean, yeah. we got to over, we just got to let go of the fear. Yeah. You know, I mean, really, that's what it is. And it's possible. I mean, I like to think about, you know, these examples. Look, back during the Vietnam War, I remember uh, the protests and everything. And and in Vietnam, there were monks that would come and just drench themselves in gasoline and set themselves on fire. And they would sit there burning until they just fell over. You, you would never see anything like that on television these days. But back then, before censorship and all that, um, we, we had access to seeing these things. And it really made me see it is possible to completely overcome fear and just sit there and just take, you know, take it and respond in the, whatever way you're responding, but without fear. It was so powerful. It really changed my whole life from that point on. It's like, yeah, people don't have to be afraid. Yeah. And that's the reptilian brain. And that's why that's why it's so easy for them to, to um, manipulate it, because we have that part of our brain that's called the reptilian brain. And they resonate with it. And that's fear. That's survival. Everybody has it. But we don't have to relate to it as strongly. We could be free of it. Mm -hmm. to, to the most part. I mean, we're not going to completely get rid of it because it's built into the body, you know, but we don't have to um, be afraid by watching the news 24 seven, all that. Yeah. So our I mean, job I, is to just let go of fear. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I mean, I think, I mean, I think also part of the whole problem is just that massing these groups of uh beings obeying a hierarchy and it's like why are we obeying our leaders when they say go to war why are we obeying them 
when they say when why are the Russian soldiers obeying their leaders and invading Ukraine? Like it's you know it's he I mean and that's something that they say the reptilians love to do is they just love to use proxies. They love to use other beings to fight their battles and to and it's just it's the same thing with human leaders and power mongers. They use you know us lowly humans, poor humans to be their soldiers to fight with each other for whatever you know whimsical things they want and it's just humans if everyone just knew okay we are we are not just sitting here on this planet fighting each other we are we are literally being used as a zoo or cattle for more much more powerful beings and all these wars are simply a way to distract us and keep us stirred up and afraid and on edge so that they can continue to you know get whatever benefit they get from humanity and keep a small group of humans you know getting some benefit being the wealthy one percent i mean it reminds me of a circus you know all these wild animals you know standing on their hind legs and begging and you know doing these tricks and it's because they're terrified they're terrified of getting a hook in the leg or a whip on the back and that's exactly we're all kind of stepping through what we have been trained to do and um yeah we got to figure out how to get get out of that situation yeah there there is good uh things happening um decentralized social uh so social um technologies are coming out i think uh oh gosh what was the guy's name who first built twitter um remember his name jack jack dorsey dorsey, jack dorsey yeah yeah, he's working on a lot of decentralized technology built on blockchains and stuff. So people will begin to organize or be, have the ability, let's say, to organize uh, without interference. And that that's hopeful, I think, if, if if people even want to look at it. But and, you know, I've said a number of times, I feel like we are being categorized, you know, it's like, Okay, those people over there who are completely stuck in the first, you know, survival, fear, anger, chakra, we can't communicate with them. So who's in the second chakra? You know, that's where, you know, it's it's also a very dark energy down there, addictions and cravings. And and so if if they can categorize us according to our chakra frequencies, they can get a sense of percentages, I guess, of how many people are really reaching and asking and ready to break free. But it feels like we're being categorized. Yeah, I don't know what is. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess my, my mind is kind of just blown by the whole narrative of what I'm what, you know, what they're saying from Farsight, you know, it's like, I mean, I they it seems clear that ufos are real they're real ships they've really been flying around earth for a long time and if and if that's true then some sort of aliens seem to also be real i mean with also the tons of abduction stories and interactions it it seems to me rock solid that you know gray aliens are real reptilian aliens are real human looking aliens are real and if and if if we just start with that then there has to be something some giant narrative of politics and history that there, there's something that's true. I, you know, whether or not in Farsight, they, they claim to actually have a, a good view of what this overarching narrative is. And there's, it's kind of pretty dark, you know, <laughs> for the people that started out looking at aliens and looking at this as like, Oh, this is fun and fascinating. You know, they, Everyone, there's a ton of the ufology community wants to just believe the thing that uh, Sukulis says, uh, which is that they're definitely real, but if they wanted to hurt us, they could have done it at any time because they're way more powerful than us, so they can't be bad. And Stephen Greer also is like, there's no bad aliens. There's no, they're all good. They're all enlightened. And Farsight is like, uh-uh, <laughs> we are in a prison <laughs> we're on a prison planet 
and the well, it's yeah. like are cowboys evil you know no i don't think cowboys are evil but they know how to push cattle around and get them to go where they want to go they're not evil um from the point of view of the cattle they are from the point of the, yeah exactly exactly um so yeah i get that you can look yeah, at both sides for p and some people it's like i asked the question years ago on one of my Facebook posts, would you rather be a poodle or a wolf, right? Mm -hmm. As a poodle is required, has a lot of requirements that it can't take care of its own needs. And I think a lot of people are in that position. And then to be a wolf is in my mind, you know, more independent, you know how to garden, you know how to survive and comfortable and uh, independent. Um, and if we're yeah. all just poodles, you know, then we need our cowboys and or not poodles, but you know, cattle, then we need our cowboys. Yeah. Well, it seems though that I mean, I get the feeling that humanity doesn't need the reptilians. Like if, if there's really I mean, humanity, as far as I can tell, we do feed ourselves. We do, you know, we they seem to be getting a benefit from us. I'm not sure we're not benefiting from them. So it's like, this is not a, a symbiotic relationship. This is an exploitive relationship. Right. Um, certainly seems. And and I have a, and another thread I want to talk about before I forget, um, you know, the Farsight Institute and Courtney Brown, they are saying there are some malevolent groups here, the reptilians and the Orions, and they are asking the Galactic Federation and this other group, a uh, group called the domain to use their military to help intimidate the reptilians and the orions to leave earth that's basically what courtney is saying um he's saying this is not their home world who is asking for that the farsight and courtney brown he's the head oh, yeah. of the mm -hmm. farsight institute so but this is what i want to say you know if if they can telepathically negotiate with aliens i don't understand I, I would negotiate with the reptilians and the Orions. I would contact them. You know, I'm kind of like a part of me is a little bit disappointed that they think, you know, because if you have a neighbor, you know, or if the town next to you is just like really hostile and angry, the, the solution is not to go to another town and say, help us force everyone in that town to leave. That's not right. That's like that's uh, closer to genocide. You know, that's closer to. Um, you know, I mean, I mean, and I guess he, he said this, you know, he, he said something in this, uh, other video I watched that just before the show where he's saying, we don't believe they're all evil. And we do believe, sure. Someday the reptilians might be able to evolve to be more enlightened, but at the moment we just need humanity that needs to be free from them and we need them to go away and we can't help them. And maybe we can inspire them by us enlightening ourselves, but, but he's, Anyways, I would, you know, okay, so this is this is my surprise. I've got a surprise for you. Okay. <laughs> I emailed the most, one of the most amazing Farsight remote viewers. Her name is Yame. Um, and uh, oh. you may have seen her. She goes, she's called Princess. Oh, yeah, yeah. I've seen her. Yeah. Yeah. So she, um, she is, I've watched so many of their videos. And the thing that the first video I watched with Farsight was their Lacerta interview remote viewing, where they had multiple people remote view to the moment of the Lacerta transcript interview between a female reptilian alien and this guy in Switzerland, supposedly. They wanted to see if it was real. They wanted to see if Lacerta was real. And all of their remote viewers saw it, saw this interview, confirmed it was real. Um, and but when Yame did it, she actually saw Lacerta and and communicated with Lacerta in live time. Ooh, and yeah. it's an incredibly powerful video, just blew me away. And and she and I've you know, she has um whenever you see like the remote viewing sessions, hers are always incredibly unique because she often has a, a live telepathic connection with uh beings in the some of these sites because these sites apparently have telepathic beings there often guarding them um and uh anyways i know it's a lot it's a lot to handle 
but it's a lot, you know, but yeah, I, I do believe in a lot of this stuff to some degree. I mean, in, in fact, to quite a lot a degree, but yeah, there's gray area in there that I, I haven't really been able to venture into. Um, yes, it, I know it's a, it's a lot to, this is a crazy, crazy potentiality, but I mean, for me, it just starts with if, if it's, there is so much evidence that telepathy is real and that aliens have telepathy. And yes. so that is a, I have, I have no problem with that. The, the, the thing that the Farsight takes it, this remote viewing takes it to a whole different level because they, they say they can go back in time or into the future and see stuff, which that is a big, big additional leap. You know, live telepathy is one thing. Viewing back in time takes it to another level. But anyways. What was the name of that movie? Tom Cruise was in it where he, they could look into the future and see who was going to commit a crime. And then they yeah. go and stop the crime. What, what was the name of that movie? I, I don't remember the name. That I want to say Time Cop, but that was like, a, that's a different movie. <laughs> but, that was a, it was like, yeah, that was a wild concept at the time. And now here we are saying, gosh, this might be, that, there might be technology that can do that. Wow. Okay. So, well, here's my, here's my surprise. Uh, one, uh, you may have said she would be a guest on our show. Uh, <gasps> okay. Yeah. And, and so really? if, if you're down with that. I'm um, down with that. Sure. And, uh, you know, and I also love that they are so into meditation, you know, and so they're perfect sort of like, um, not to mention they're so into figuring out what's going on with aliens. And she just seems to have, it'll just be fascinating. I, I just have so many questions for her. <laughs> Let's do it. Yeah, okay. I'm up for that. Wow. All right. So um, are you down with if, if she's available next Friday? Should we just go for it next Friday? Jump in. Sure. Okay. Okay, good. And uh, yeah. Okay. So, but this is what I wanted to sort of say. Why didn't Courtney, why doesn't he discuss, you know, contact the leaders of the reptilians and the Orions and negotiate with them? Why not go straight to the heart there and... Um, I don't know if, if, if EMA is really able to telepathically, like in live time, talk to Lacerta, who seems to be a leader of the reptilians, then wouldn't you love to just be, it'd be like talking to Putin. It'd be like, I want to, right. talk. why not? Let's talk. Let's figure out why can't we like come up with a peace plan for how to live together, you know? Right. Um, right. But yeah, that's kind of my like crazy dream. No, uh, that's not crazy. I think that makes more sense than a lot of stuff that yeah. they've tried. So. And even, you know, he says, it, it seems they say that the, the control of the reptilians is coming from their home galaxy. I, I'm pretty sure they say that. So if time and space are irrelevant to remote viewing, then let's go ahead and try to connect with the leaders in the galaxy where they come from and if it's an ai that's fine let's talk to them let's you know why because it, it seems like i'm getting the sense that the reptilians are just basically okay so they did this remote viewing of the reptilians on the moon apparently they say they, they were like curious they didn't know if the reptilians had a moon base but they were like their target was the biggest reptilian controlled base on the moon and then whoever is the leader of that base they wanted to, they sort of did deep mind probes of the, the subjects they found there. And they found that the, the the beings there didn't really care that much about humans. We were literally as irrelevant as the cattle are to, you know, the cowboys. And, and we're cattle, not even, we're not even, you know, because they're like one step away. They're on the moon. They're really like prison guards just sort of sitting there doing their job. They didn't have, and several of them didn't even have harsh feelings towards humans. They just didn't really care. Some of them felt bad for us. But they, but they all had this this thing in their brain. They were just like doing their job, and if they disobeyed their hierarchy, they would be really hurt. And so it was it was just it just felt so similar to how you might describe like Nazi, you know, soldiers. It's like they have to obey the hierarchy of the, the system they're in because it's hard to just disobey and get killed and have your family killed. And it's so it's really it's all about the hierarchy. It is who the heck is at the top that is forcing everyone below them to obey. And then also like, how do you get, how do you stir a revolution amongst the people in that hierarchy and just get them to break free from their own chains? It's like yeah. everyone is in chains of these hierarchies. 
Yeah. Who who owns the farm? <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, I guess another another sort of thought I had, it's really shifted for me. You know, I, there's Lou Elizondo, David Grush, um, Ryan Graves, uh, Braver, all these all these whistleblowers that are or Christopher Mellon that are that seem to be fighting for disclosure. They I'm pretty convinced they're not they're not independent actors. They are organized together and I, I think they're being paid by a portion of the US government. Like a portion of the US government of our intelligence community, military is fighting for disclosure. They they want to have controlled disclosure that keeps the US in a position of power. They don't want to reveal too much of what the US knows, but they are ready to get everyone on earth to realize there are aliens. And they are fighting against another part of the US government that's entrenched in the CIA and the military industrial complex that is probably also getting paid by a portion of the US government. So it's so anyways, my, my point is Lou Elizondo, David Grush, I mean, they're not independent. They are they are like um, they're still working for the yeah. government. Someone is controlling them and telling, giving them orders of what they can say and what they can't say. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so it kind of bugs a lot of people that believe that or suspect that are kind of bugged by like Stephen Greer says, Lou Elizondo is an intelligence agent. And Lou Elizondo gets very offended by that and says, and says Stephen Greer is a complete, you know, fraud and <laughs> charlatan. So they, Do some you know, mudslinging, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you've, you've seen them mudsling like that, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Well, but if you so it's like I kind of understand the hostility about Grush and Elizondo still they're still I mean because I do believe they are basically obeying somebody, some hierarchy in the government, but it's like seems to be a better hierarchy. It seems to have a, a little bit, you know, they're they're the they're the equivalent of the good guys in the government. They they seem to actually be in favor of democracy. Mm -hmm. But but if you put us in the context of a prison planet, my attitude towards uh, all of these people changes, you know, because that's a much more dangerous situation. You know, it's like in um, there's Battlestar Galactica. The the there was a that's a show that they made a remake of it, and there was a uh, a series where the people, the the good guys on Battlestar Galactica, were in prison on a planet. And they had to create an underground secret, you know, resistance movement. And they had to do some harsh things to try to break out of that prison planet. And same thing happens inside, like in Star Trek. They did it a few times. They had the, the Star Trek heroes being in prison on a planet or something. And they had to create a resistance movement to break out. And, and if we're on a prison planet, then that means everyone that's working for disclosure is part of part of a pretty dangerous resistance movement. And so they, I just kind of respect their need to, to try to do what they're doing um, more. I don't know if that makes any sense. Yeah. You yeah. Know? No, it does. Yeah. Um, you know, it, I kind of have to get to the point in my own head where whether anything is true, even the, even the worst of the worst, if it's true, or if it's not true, I have to really, and this is my spiritual practice, is I really pay attention to how that's affecting my, well, emotional body, right? The resonance. Is it tr triggering fear and, and all of that? I mean, so when you become mindful, it, it, all of this is like, maybe it's true and maybe it's not. And if the fear comes up, just look at the fear. Don't look at the issue. Just say, hmm, it's still there. If you if you look at where it's manifesting in your body long enough, it will begin to dissolve. It's like pouring drops of water on a lump of, of sugar or salt. You stare at your fear long enough, it begins to dissolve. And I think that's kind of the direction we have to move in if we're going to try to have any independence and sovereignty. We have to move away from that triggering fear. Oh my gosh, this is so real. And we're going to all be, you know, imp you know, tortured and never find happiness. And our kids are all going to die in prison. We have to let go of the fear of that and come into a space where we, because there is ultimately, well, first of all, we're all going to die, right? Nobody gets out alive. So what is it we're being afraid of? 
its concepts, its ideas, oh, my kids, my family, my, you know, my house, whatever, all of it's going to, my grandfather used to say, what's it going to matter in a hundred years? Everything we know will be gone. Whether, whether we win or not, it, <laughs> what's it going to matter in a hundred years? We've got to let go of the fear if we're going to save ourselves. You know, this brings me to, to another issue that was talked about was the death trap. Uh -huh. Right? That was a big one. Yeah. What What did you think of that? Yeah. So the Can you explain it to the listeners, because um. Well, you probably okay, know so they're basic. Than... Yeah, their theory. Uh, well, they, and they said they did a remote viewing to say what seems to see what happens when people die, and they say that our souls. They they don't use the word soul, but um that there really is an immortal soul that is inside of all of us. And when we die, it really does leave our body and start to go somewhere. And they say that it's actually part of the prison here on earth that they then they get the soul to go into the light, which is actually a trap. And then in the light, they zap our soul with electricity. It wipes our memory enough that we get confused and then they get us to consent to come back down into earth into a new body. It's kind of a, a sci-fi way framework that kind of explains the reincarnation trap that Buddhists oh, yeah. and some religions yeah. describe. Um, and they, I haven't watched this yet, but they have a video on Lao Tzu, I think is. Mm -hmm. And they say he was able to, uh, through meditation, break out of the cycle. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, so anyway, see, and it seems they've, you know, um, it's unclear to me, uh, that's actually one of the areas I'd really like to talk to EMA about. Cause I, I don't think what they say about the death traps, it doesn't correlate well with all the near death experience videos that I've watched, or at least I don't you know, I want to know if, are they claiming that all of these near death experience videos that talk about an incredibly positive uh other world and dimension that you go to are they claiming that is all a lie like is it all an alien deception and that all the relatives that they meet and that when they go into the is all far is all false like Maybe. that's like that's a big big claim that's a big and, one. yeah yeah and uh i mean that also that's actually one of the more disturbing things because because you know my mom passed on and I all the time meditate and imagine sort of trying to reach and communicate with her. And I don't like the thought that she might've been zapped and forced to come back into another life. I like to think that she's alive in another dimension. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, yeah. So it's uh, that's a big one. It's um, a big one. When you think about your loved ones, you know, gosh, where are they? But if it's true that they, you know, we go, we get, we, you know, go out, we go into the light, we get zapped and we come back in. I mean, that's no different than what the Buddhists believe in reincarnation. Yeah. Um, and to get off this so-called wheel of karma, it's the same thing. You have to let go of all the attachments and all the fear and just rely on your own inner you know, your own inner self, you, we have to not be reaching out and looking for the answers outside. And I think when we die, I don't think we go anywhere. I think we expand into a higher, you know, a different state of consciousness. Um, and it depends on where we're resonating. If we die in a, in a state of terror and fear, then we're expanding into that, into that realm and so on up the scale through the chakras if you expand if you die and you're in a heart you know loving um space you you kind of expand into that realm you go wherever you are <laughs> which is an interesting way so it's not like we should be looking you know so i gotta as soon as i die i gotta start looking for the light i think no we just have to be with who we really are and and be the best we can be Yeah. Big subject, a big subject, but I would like to hope that this doesn't terrorize people and it could, you know, it's, oh my gosh, I better not go towards the light. I think what we need to do is just be fully present with who we are and be loving in that awareness, 
not go looking for anything because there's nothing else out there. It's just right here. I think when our body stops, we just expand. We don't, I don't think we actually travel anywhere. We just expand into a different realm of consciousness. That's my two cents. <laughs> well, I, I definitely feel an issue with memory. Like, I mean, even just in this life, I feel, I, I personally feel very frustrated that I can't remember every detail. I, I, I forget things so easily. I can't remember my dreams. So I do, I feel like um, there's something, I don't feel like our memory has to be this bad. And I know other people have better memory than me. Mm -hmm. So I don't, you know, it do, it does seem like, you know, you know, I, I don't know. I would, uh, I, I feel like there is, when I think about that, I feel like something's blocking my ability to remember everything I could remember. And, you know, there's been times where I meditate and I feel like I've, I just, I feel, I see and feel so much truth in, and I feel at peace and I feel like I could just meditate forever. And I feel like if I just did that, it would change the entire world, you know? I agree. And, yes. yes. And and so it's like, it's like, uh, I feel like you pass through something when you meditate and get to that point. And maybe it, you know, it connects to this. Maybe we are actually passing through something and reaching out beyond some sort of mental energy block that engulfs our planet, you know, yeah. and I don't know. Yeah. That, uh... I think I think a good thing to to kind of contemplate is, you know, why are we afraid of death? You know, it's it sounds shocking. It's like, oh, death, of course, everybody. But we we carry it around like constantly and it's being constantly stimulated by by this reptilian mentality. I think overcoming the fear of death we won't drop into those deep realms anymore. And once that happens, I think that facilitates better memory. You know, when we go into that fear, anger, reptilian brain, we're not even in our whole brain. We have limited ourselves severely. We're, we're all we're looking at is, you know, food, water, you know, and the rest of our brain is basically shut down. When you go into the mammalian brain or reptilian brain, whatever you call it, the frontal cortex is, is compromised. And if we let go of fear, let, you know, so the reptilian brain is not controlling us, I believe we can have access to more and more. And the whole spiritual path, they say, it's just all about remembering. And in order to remember, you have to let go of the the fear because it's the stress cortisol hormones they just screw up everything inclu including memory well do do you want to uh close us out with a med little guided meditation let's do it just to just to calm our nerves and be okay with whatever's happening all right yeah so let's take a nice deep breath Feel your feet on the floor, your butt on the cushion, or wherever your weight is against the earth. Hands in the lap. Let's contemplate the amazing situation that we are in. Just amazing. Isn't it interesting? If we can look at all of this with curiosity and even humor, we don't know what's going on. We're just stirred up. What we do know is that we are right here, right now. In this environment, each of us in our own little environments, whether it's a living room or a bedroom or a car or wherever you are, the fact that we are right here, right now, is all we know. Isn't that amazing? Breathing in and breathing out. 
everything else is a thought, a memory, a worry, a plan, even a joke. Maybe it's just all a game. The only thing we know is that we are right here, right now. Breathing in and breathing out. Feel the life in your hands. The hands almost tingle with life. The body loves to have you just pay attention to stretch or move. Just feel it. And then there's the face muscles. What is your jaw doing? Is it tight? Are your eyes squinting? Is your brow furled? All these sensations happening right now. Let's try to approach life with a sense of curiosity wonder, amazement, amusement. Compassion for people who are very confused and locked in. What an incredible adventure. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, Dora. Have a great week. You too.